So, um, what I'd like to talk to you about this afternoon is uh, details, um, lots of details, and why they matter. And importantly, the problem that we encounter when people often look at something and say, well, that's just a detail. We do that all the time. We hear that all the time. And I, I, I want to get back to a sort of a deeper understanding of what we mean by detail and the idea that when somebody says that's just details, that's probably only the beginning of the story, not the end of the story. So um, things, things that I need to mention. Uh, that's me. I edited a book. Um, there is a Czech translation of this book. Um, I have no idea why there is a Czech translation, um, because all the other translations are of languages with slightly more obscure alphabets and uh, much larger populations. Um, I had, uh, I had uh, when I mentioned this to somebody in Germany, uh, he got really annoyed. He said, well, look, the German, German market's much bigger than the Czech market. Why did they get a translation and we don't? It's like, well, you know, not, I, didn't, I didn't decide. Anyway, should you wish, there is a Czech translation. Um, I've only got Chinese translations of these, um, but should you wish, there are Chinese translations available. Uh, but the point of me putting these books up here is a slight introduction of myself, Kevlin Henney. I, I'm independent. I do training, consultancy, and all kinds of things, and um, hang out on Twitter and on airplanes. Uh, and I have an interest in both what we might consider to be the small detail and the big picture, the architectural view and perspective and how people reason about things and the process and practices they bring to the code. Now, when we normally look at this stuff, what do we mean by programs and software? I think mean, one of my favorite definitions comes from Maya Lehman in a paper uh, published in 1980. This paper is, is, is brilliant. There's so many things in it. And if you go, you know, I, every now and then I go back and look at it and say, oh, he knew this back in 1980. Um, uh, but there's also some humor, and this is one of my favorite pieces. In Programs, Life Cycles, and Laws of Software Evolution, any program is a model of a model within a theory of a model of an abstraction of some portion of the world or of some universe of discourse. He must have had fun with that sentence. Okay? And if, so if anybody ever asks you, what is it that you do? Direct them to this. I work in this domain. But we have an interesting problem with the word abstraction. Uh, the word abstraction, we often forget, we use it in so many places, we use the word abstract and abstraction, we talk about layers of abstraction, we talk about abstract classes, we talk about skills with abstraction, we use these terms, but what does it actually mean? And to abstract is to remove, in fact literally from the Latin abstrahere means to draw off water, it's about removal. Why would we remove something? Well, because there's too much of it. And the idea is that we do this for a reason. And the problem is sometimes people think, oh, abstraction is about being vague. And Dijkstra kind of nailed it. The purpose of an abstraction is not to be vague, but to create a new semantic level in which one can be absolutely precise. That's the measure of a good abstraction. A good abstraction is where you take away all the stuff that you don't need. So all the stuff that you really need to focus on is there. Now, this is important because this is where we get into trouble over details and meanings and things like that. What if you remove the wrong thing? What if you take away or ignore things that were really important? And this is the skill in abstraction. It also tells us what a good abstraction is versus a poor abstraction. <laughs> now, semantics. When we talk about semantics in software, I'd like to think that we were actually talking about meaning, but this is where it comes up so often in conversation. If you ever get into a discussion with somebody, it doesn't have to be about software. It can be about any debate, about any subject almost. And eventually there will come a point where you sort of point out the meaning of a word or, well, you know, this word suggests that you believe this or you're doing that. And somebody, oh, that's just semantics. I've, I've always struggled with when somebody says that. What does that actually mean? We're we having a discussion about something really important. We're having a discussion about meaning, that's what it means. It's just semantics. Oh, don't worry about meaning, we're having a discussion. Well, surely it's all about meaning. It's just meaning. They will say it's just details as well. So, what do we know about details? Well, 
Back in uh, more programming pearls, Peter Weinberger is quoted as details count. And we can actually see um, there's this whole point in software is that details are the essence of software. That is what software is. It's lots of details put together in a way that hopefully works. That's the whole point of software. Everything else is just hand waving and documents. Software is about all of, the detail, all of the details. You cannot skip any of the details. You might get somebody else to do some of them for you. This is why we build and we have technology stacks. And this is where the abstraction plays in our favor. But there is a point here. It is all about the details. You cannot forget the details. They will always be there. And if you're not aware of them, they may surprise you. But that also takes a certain mindset. Um, Marissa Meyer had this uh, a lovely way of putting it. Geeks are people who love something so much that all the details matter. So there's this kind of idea of like, that is what characterizes it. Whenever people ask me about, well, I'm thinking about getting a career, or my son and daughter are thinking about pursuing something in software, um, they want to get into computer science or do a software engineering qualification, and, you know, but they don't have maths, or they don't have, and they, they pick a subject they think is important for computing. And although there are lots of things that are important in developing modern software, it turns out that this is the attitude that matters most and will get you the furthest. But there's actually a little bit more to it. It's a lovely book, um, Think Like an Artist, by Will Gompertz, um, where he's talking about creativity. And one of the things that we are doing in software, it was, software is not a manufacturing, um, it's, it's not a manufacturing discipline, or rather, yeah, compilers. They're, they're the manufacturing part of software. We solved that problem decades ago, and we've just got better at it. It's not manufacturing, it's creativity. And creativity is quite a difficult thing um, to explore sometimes and to look for the right attitude. And Will Gompertz puts it like this. We're talking about a very specific mindset that is crucial when it comes to the act of creating. It is an attitude that can be encapsulated in a simple but demanding rule. Always think both big picture and fine detail. That is sometimes the problem that we find is that sometimes we get drawn into the smallest details and forget to come out again. Somewhere, there is an application waiting to be built. Somewhere, that line of code belongs in a larger architecture and has consequences. So as he says, it's a demanding rule, but this idea of being able to go big picture, little detail, big picture, and a fine detail. And it's not like a sort of a, it's not like some kind of waterfall life cycle. Historically, people have tried to say, well, what we do is we start with a big picture, and then slowly we come into land. It's a beautiful image. Slowly we come into land, and as we get closer to the ground, we see more detail, and that's when we focus on the detail. So as time increases, the detail increases. That's beautiful. It's also massively wrong. The point here is that you end up bouncing up and down. The, the airplane metaphor really doesn't work in this case. You are zooming in and zooming out all the time. So when we talk about software, how do we talk about software? Well, we might talk about software and, and sort of say, oh, it's the big stuff. There's large stuff, and then there's small stuff. And then we'll sort of use terms like, oh, implementation. As if implementation is something, it's an afterthought. It doesn't matter. And we'll use phrases like implementation details, or we'll say things like design details. Now, here's the curious thing. Um, design details are made up of decisions. How how do you know if a decision is big or little? You might say, well, if it's a code decision, then it's little. And if it's an architecture decision, if, it's, if it appears on a PowerPoint diagram, then it must be big. That's kind of everybody's mental metric, PowerPoint architecture. Yeah? Um, and PowerPoint architecture and architecture by certain kinds of diagrams is a terrible way to judge the significance of a system. Um, I am going to presume that everybody has seen the architecture diagram of the Java libraries and runtime on the front page of the Java docs, it is magnificent. It has no meaning at all. It's got lots of colors, and it has no semantics whatsoever. It really isn't just semantics. It has no meaning. It doesn't tell you anything about Java or its libraries, but it does look pretty and clickable, and that's it. So it is gloriously ineffective, but a lot of people think that's what PowerPoint architecture is. Um, it's not. The design decisions are sometimes very surprising. And we have this interesting challenge. We're going to talk about architecture, and we're going to talk about decisions. There is a relationship between them. They're not about PowerPoint architecture and diagram size. Booch puts it like this. Architecture represents the significant design decisions that shape a system. So in other words, not all design decisions are created equal. 
where significant is measured by cost of change. Well, that's interesting because it's not about size on the diagram, it's about effort. It's about cost, it's about time. If somebody says, how much effort would it take to change this? And you go, oh, we need a whole project for that. Or, oh, we can fit that in a sprint, probably in a day or two, and a couple of developers can work on it. That tells you different ends of the range. It also tells you that there are some surprising things. Okay, let me pick on one. How do you spell clonable? You know, everybody in here is going, oh, that's just, yeah, I know how to spell that. It's in java.lang, that's easy. C-L-O-N-E-A-B-L-E. -E. Brilliant, well that was easy. Now, there's only one problem with that. That's not actually the correct spelling of clonable. In as much as English has any logic to it, and sometimes it surprises people, and I'm going to say English does have logic to it. It has about six or seven different kinds of logic in it, all existing at the same time in the same place. That's the bit that's hard. But in as much as there is any logic to English spelling, clonable should not have that first E. Clonable should be spelled C-L-O-N-A-B-L-E. So I'm expecting after this talk, everybody's going to submit bug report to Oracle. You need to change the spelling. You need to fix that. How much would that cost? How big a change is that? Well, I just do a shortcut on my IDE, and the world changes. No, if, they, if, somebody at, if somebody at Oracle decides, yeah, let's just do that, the world breaks. That's the other definition of architecture. If you change something and lots of people you've never met start shouting at you, the more people and the louder they shout, the more architectural that was. So it turns out that a spelling mistake, that's why they've never fixed it, because they can't, because there's no appropriate aliasing mechanism or migration path to allow that. And so people just say, oh, that's just a detail. And yet, the world over, Everybody's spelling clonable wrong. Hell, even Microsoft did it because of Sun originally. So we have this rather curious thing. It's not going to change the runtime a lot, but here's the point. Architecture is a set of decisions, and it's a set of decisions we don't yet know everything about because things change. So we can have a rather nice look at this wonderful definition. Uh, architecture is a hypothesis that needs to be proven by implementation and measurement from Tom Gilb. It's a really simple idea. When you make an assertion, when you say this will be faster, this will be more scalable, this will be easier to maintain and cheaper to maintain, these are actually testable propositions. Some of them can be tested at runtime, some of them can be tested over a period of sprints. If you say something is easier to maintain or cheaper to maintain, that's a testable hypothesis. So you make these decisions, but don't overcommit. That's the point, you don't know which ones are significant yet. It's a continuous cycle of experimentation. Now, obviously, this also gives us a useful definition of how um, robust an architecture is and how good it is. It actually tells us, in fact, going back to Grady's definition here, this actually tells us what a good architecture is. A good architecture is one in which the changes that we want to make are not the most expensive ones. Okay, it's a very simple way of doing that, and you're not going to find that out unless you actually start exploring the system and measuring things. Now, you have, we have some advice from the deep past. I started off with 1980, and then I went into the 1970s with Dijkstra, so I'm going to go right back to the beginning of the 70s with Parnas. And this is one of the most overlooked quotations in terms of understanding why it is that we partition systems, why we partition systems uh, across services, processes, across classes, across separate methods and small functions. This is why we do it. There is this very simple idea of figuring out, well, we propose that one begins with a list of difficult design decisions or design decisions which are likely to change. How do you know something's likely to change? Because you and your colleague can't agree on it. That's a really simple technique. It's not a guarantee, but sometimes we are very poor at understanding that the discussion that we're having with our colleague is not about who is right and wrong, but the fact that what we've both got is a sense of how large the landscape of the decision is. They think something's different. You have a different idea. You know what? You may both be right, but at different times. But this is a warning. This is a suggestion. The very fact that it is not obvious may be a strong indicator that you shouldn't couple to it too strongly. In other words, we're not really sure about this, so perhaps we shouldn't have everybody depend on that small assumption. Let's isolate ourselves, put a bit of distance. And therefore, you can actually 
come up with a, a rough guide to how your system should be structured and separated just based on confidence and discussion without actually going into um, uh, all of the hard stuff. So each module is then designed to hide such a decision from the others. How do we know what we're doing? How do we get empirical? How do we find out and use an implementation? Well, actually, this is old advice from Jack Reeves. So we're going to fast forward to the 1990s. Programming is a design activity. And as he observes, it actually makes more sense more often than believed. Often the process of rendering the design in code will reveal oversights and the need for additional design effort. The earlier this occurs, the better the design will be. So what we're doing is we're getting a heads up there that we can't really plan this stuff. You can kind of plan how you might approach the whole thing, but you can't plan it in the sense of saying exactly this feature and exactly this goal will be achieved in this week. It doesn't mean it's total chaos, but it does allow us certain opportunities to come up with something better and to make discoveries and not be surprised. Now, there's this book by Robert McKee called Story. Um, I don't know, I'm interested in uh, writing fiction. Um, I'm not interested in screenwriting, but this is very much about um, screenwriting, uh, you know, fiction and screenwriting. And there's this lovely quote in there where he says, if a plot works out exactly as you first planned, you're not working loosely enough to give room to your imagination and instincts. And I quite like this way of thinking about it. He's making this observation when it comes to people writing stories. And there is this idea that you should expect things to be different. That when you set out and you say, this is how I'm going to build it, that's your initial hypothesis. And you're expecting to get better at it. In fact, we might actually say, if somebody comes along and says, hey, guess what? Our project was delivered exactly as we expected. There were no surprises. Everything went as planned. In one sense, that sounds like good news. But in another sense, there's a little bit of me that feels disappointed because it suggests we learned nothing. It suggests that we did something that didn't reveal anything new either to ourselves or to the world. There's an idea there that actually you want something unknown, something surprising, something that is perhaps even better than you had hoped. So there's this idea that perhaps we don't want everything to go to plan. We don't want chaos, but those two are not, you know, one's not the opposite of the other. Now, um, one of the things that I, I, I do is I'm, I'm very interested in words and language, and I run a page on Facebook called Word Friday. Um, and every Friday, uh, I, come up, I, I sort of find an unusual word or you know, an unusual word or phrase, and I will offer a definition. I have not yet done today's, so you have to watch. Um, but this is one of my favorite ones. It relates to how we should be thinking in terms of our, uh, our code and our activities around the code base. Panzer. It's a lovely word because nobody can guess what it means until they see the definition. Writer who writes by the seat of their pants. They have no idea what they're doing. There's a beautiful quote from an author who was once asked by a little girl, why are you typing so fast? And he says, because I want to find out what happens. Okay? There's this revelation that as you approach the detail, the story actually appears. As we approach the detail, we start learning really important things about the implementation of our system, about the technologies that we have or have not chosen, about our colleagues, about our tests, about the domain. All of these things are there to be discovered, and it's very, very unlikely that you know everything about all of them at the right time. And often people feel a little panicked by this. They want the comfort of saying, no, 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 we must know everything. And there's a, there's a little bit of a problem with that. It, this is not really, you can't know it until you've done it, like with stories. Until somebody you've actually written it, you won't know. Until it's been told, we cannot tell. So there is this idea that it's okay to operate with incomplete knowledge. It, the contrast, it's not a binary contrast, it's more of a spectrum. In contrast to a plotter, that's the other term, plotters and pantsers. A pantser doesn't work to or have an outline. And we can see that different Developers or different projects are on a, on a spectrum from plotters all the way through to pure pantsers. Okay? So there's a kind of spectrum along there. And what I want to try and suggest is that this is okay. Um, it's okay not to be a plotter. It's okay to sort of say, actually, we do need a little bit of that you know, creativity. Uh, we need some of those surprises. Because we are, by definition, working with incomplete knowledge. You don't have all of the details, but you know how to discover them. Programming is a great way to figure out details. 
Yeah? So that they will come to you. So there's this idea that operating with incomplete knowledge is fine. You do it every day when you get up in the morning. So some of these details <coughs> turn out to be quite big. Um, a number of years ago, you know, a couple of years ago, I decided for whatever reason to submit a bug report to Facebook. Your feedback will be used to improve Facebook. I doubt that very much. I have not noticed that. Thanks for taking the time to make a report. How much time? 31st of December, 1969. Okay. I mean, I'm old, but, you know, and I'm older than that. But uh, Facebook's not that old. What's going on here? Well, what we see here is a detail. We've seen a detail that creeps out. That is strangely close to the 1st of January, 1970, which, as we all know, is the beginning of time. Okay? Now, I quite like the fact that because I was born before the beginning of time, that effectively makes me an eternal. Uh, so I, I quite like that. Um, and also, I'm hoping to live beyond the end of the Unix 32-bit clock. So that really is, you know, yeah, I have lived all of time. I'm looking forward to that. Um, so anyway, back before the Big Bang, on the 31st of December, 1969, what could possibly explain this? Well, well... I think they, they kind of fail to anticipate the fact that using a signed integer number of seconds since midnight, 1st of January 1970, well, sometimes you might do something and it goes negative, and maybe you need to check that every now and then. I suspect very much that this was just minus one, and that minus one was enough to push it to the other side of midnight and give us this surprise. Oh, but that's just a detail, your choice of whether or not you're using a 32-bit signed thing. It's a small coding detail. It's a little int. No, that's the whole point. The whole software system is built out of little details. And you change one thing and you get surprises like this. And this is fortunately fairly minor, but there are underflow and overflow and wraparound errors that have had huge consequences. Billions of dollars worth huge consequences. So, yeah, that's just a detail. It's just a small representation choice. Um, kind of the programming demigod. John Carmack, uh, he, um, he had this lovely uh, uh, quote in a paper on uh, functional, uh, borrowing functional idioms uh, into procedural languages. A large fraction of the flaws in software development are due to programmers not fully understanding all the possible states their code may be executed in. And this is quite a challenge, because what you do is you're building up a model. And what, notice what he's saying. Programmers not fully understanding. And this is important, because this is where we get the relationship between those who develop the software and those who actually, um, uh, uh, you know, and the code itself. There is a relationship here. Do you understand it? If you don't understand it, it doesn't matter how good the code is, you don't understand it. That is going to be your biggest obstacle. Um, you are not only working with incomplete knowledge, you are working with knowledge that you cannot obtain. The whole point is a system should be discoverable. The idea is that we should be able to learn something that we don't know. If we make the system as clever as possible, but don't allow ourselves to transmit knowledge, there's going to be no learning. So let's just pick on a very small detail. And the differences that people have in terms of understanding the relationship of states. Because if we're going to talk about things like bits, let's talk about memory. Um, and I've got a picture of uh, a Shakespeare statue up here. Um, because it turns out that Shakespeare was one of the great programmers. Um, but because, the, because of the complete absence of computers 400 years ago, he had to carefully encode all the programming wisdom in written form as plays. Yeah? And you heard of the actor model. It goes back centuries. So here we're going to talk about Hamlet, which is actually a play about memory management. Yeah, no, there you go. There's the classic line from Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question. This object, should, well, should we still have it? Okay, do I need it? Well, yeah, I don't need it, sure, but where does it go? Who's, who's looking after it? It's taking up space. This is the question. And there have been basically broad two, uh, two broadly different schools of thought on this one. You have Ophelia's point of view. "'Tis in my memory locked, and you yourself shall keep the key of it." You see, Ophelia takes the kind of explicit memory management model, the kind of the C and C++ approach. Yeah? You allocated it, you delete it. Okay. Hamlet, on the other hand, so this is the whole play. Yeah? You're going to see the play in completely different light now. Hamlet, on the other hand, is he favors garbage collection. Okay? 
Yay, from the table of my memory, I'll wipe away, uh, wipe away all trivial fond uh, records. It's, it's, uh, he's talking there. Look, records, okay? That's software terminology here. So you can see Shakespeare was ahead of the game, drawing out this fundamental dichotomy. And this has a major impact. You can sit there and go, well, the active objects that I care about in my memory only take up this many gig. But when we actually come to run the system, we seem to get sluggish performance. We seem to run out of memory because we fail to account for a number of things, memory leaks and so on. Because we have this idea that we don't actually, well, memory management is just a detail. It turns out that it's not. We can move these things around, we can make things more or less convenient. But it turns out when you start looking at memory management, that it turns out that there are people who spend a lot of time caring about it and tweaking figures and wondering whether they should get a different, you know, move to a different garbage collection model or not. It's not a detail. It may happen behind the scenes, but it's not merely a detail. It turns out it's quite important to the correct functioning of the software. Carmack goes on to sort of say, in a multi-threaded environment, the lack of understanding and the resulting problems are greatly amplified. So when we start looking at our code, we start realizing that there's something going on. In fact, there might be many things going on, and this is the challenge of threading. Almost to the point of panic if you are paying attention. Now, I like this quote because what he's saying is, if you are paying attention, you should, and you're in a multi-threaded code base, you should probably be almost panicking. Therefore, if you feel comfortable, there's a chance that you don't know enough. Yeah? It's one of those situations like, everybody else is panicking, but I feel fine. That means you don't know something that everybody else knows. Yeah, they're all running that way and you're walking that way. I would not do that if I were you. So there's a point here, again, it's about the knowledge, but it's also about our mental model of things like threading. People often say, oh, it's just a detail as to whether or not it's threading. No, it's a fundamental decision. It changes the executable perspective of every single line of code. It changes the universe of, um, uh, of your runtime in terms of what kinds of object model are safe, um, what is appropriate, should I be sharing this object with that object over there? What disciplines and practices should I be following to make this work? Why do we do it? Well, often people say, well, I want to do it because I want to make it faster. Okay? So we have this kind of care and concern. Uh, John made a, made a very important point about um, performance. Savings in time feel like simplicity. If something runs fast, people very rarely complain that things run too fast. Okay? It's one of the simplest improvements to usability you can ever make. People often worry about oh, the placement of buttons and you know, how much information there is on a page. All of these things matter, but if you make it fast, that will have the biggest usability effect of all. People just go, oh, yeah, there it is. It was done. But we have a very difficult relationship with performance and speed, because you can't just add threads to a program and you know, it goes faster. You know, so it, does, it doesn't work like that. And we also have these little sayings. People often quote, when you kind of start focusing on optimization, people often quote Donald Knuth. They say, oh, that's just a detail. Look, premature optimization is the root of all evil, or at least most of it, in programming. And people say, yeah, there you go. The great Donald Knuth said this. And everybody focuses on optimization is the root of all evil. They kind of forget there's a little bit over there that says premature. Premature means before it's time. The question is, when is that time? It's not a detail to be dismissed, it's something to be understood. What your challenge is to figure out is at what time should I care about it? And it turns out that some of these things have huge implications and are not merely implementation details. One of my favorite blog posts is from about three years ago, Adam Drake. Command line tools can be over 200 times faster than your Hadoop cluster. He takes a problem that is interesting, it's about, it's about, it uses two gig of data, and you might say, well, that's not very big data. Well, yeah, sure, but what is big data? It turns out that big is a function of time. Big is not a static concept. If you go back to the end of the 1990s, big meant two gig. I mean, people, <laughs> when you use phrases like gigabyte, people would ask you for an explanation. What is gigabyte? Well, you know what a megabyte is? Well, just about. A gigabyte's a thousand times larger. No, there can't be such things. Yes. <laughs> One day in the 21st century, we will all have gigabytes. Oh, get out of here. You know? At the, at the end of the 1990s, there was the Human Genome Project. This is, this, at the time, this would have been, we didn't have the phrase big data, but that was a big data project to decode the instructions for creating a human being. If you put, if you get, so, so basically, 
I saw a few years ago with my oldest son, we went to a museum, and they had the whole, they had the genome printed out in lots of printed volumes, okay, books. And I remember sort of looking at that and pointing to it and said, that is what it takes to make a human being. That's the instructions for a human being. It's like, wow. Anyway, we saw it again a couple of years ago at a museum. Clearly, time has passed, and I say pretty much the same thing, but he's a teenager now. He's not satisfied with that. Teenagers are never satisfied. It's a permanent state of affairs. And he, he looks at me, he says, Dad, how much memory would that be? And I said, well, I worked it out. It's about three gigabytes. And he kind of turned to me and said, you know, that's not very much. And I, I turned to him and said, you know what, that isn't. Three gigabytes. You know, I mean, you, you know, people have pictures of cats that take up more space. Collections of pictures of cat memes. Okay? Yeah, forget human genome. It's just like this is, we're talking about things that matter here. Okay? Three gig. I, I, I could sit that in that laptop over there and still be running things that are more interesting, you know, like IDEs. Uh, actually, no, just one IDE. That'll be good. They're very hungry, aren't they? Yeah. So the point here is that things, what we define as good or big, changes with time. So everybody, about 10 years ago, everybody was pushing everything out to the network. Now, using Hadoop takes a lot more effort than writing a bash script. But it turns out that there is one thing you cannot beat, and it's called the speed of light. It turns out that if you push things out to the network, don't let anybody tell you anything different. You are always slowing things down. To put something on the network is to say, I am going to slow this down. That is my goal, is to slow the system down. On the other hand, you may get a really good trade-off somewhere else that gives you a speed up, but do recognize that putting it out on the network slows it down, so there better be a good trade-off. And that's fine, that trade-off exists. But sometimes the balance changes. And just get in, a, oh look, we have enough memory to run it all at once in memory. You cannot beat that. So there is this whole idea that we've just done something, a small detail that's actually completely changed everything about the task. The number of developers, the amount of work, the amount of time taken, and the performance. In fact, we can even go and look at li the little lab rat of software development or computer science, sort, the sort algorithm. And you say, well, surely there's nothing more we can learn about sort. You know, sort is just a trivial thing. It lives in your library. You don't need to worry about the performance. Um, and, you know, performance is just a detail. And I always like to point out to people that things never matter until they matter. So, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at um, sorted. I'm going to use Python. And you're sitting there going like, hang on, this is, this is a JVM kind of conference. Yeah, fine. Imagine it's Jython. OK. Is that comfortable? Good. It wasn't. I ran it on CPython version 3. But you know, it doesn't matter. You can imagine it's, it's Jython. That's the whole point of software. It's all about imagination and uh, you know, sort of fabricating reality. So I'm going to use the default sorting algorithm. I'm going to assert that when I sort it, 314159, it's sorted. OK? There is an assertion there. We can write um, a simple function to determine whether or not um, something is in a sorted sequence, and that all works fine. The default one, okay, that's our performance. N log n. If you're doing things really badly and you want to do a bubble sort, then feel free. N squared. You say, oh yeah, but this is the detail. The library takes care of that. If you ever ask anybody, what are your performance requirements for this kind of thing? They go, oh, it doesn't really matter. Give them something really imaginative, and then they will discover that it matters. So let's try a different one. Permutation sort. Ooh, that sounds exciting. Yeah, again, you can write it in a couple of lines of Python. That's the other reason I chose Python, is that I can put it in very large font. What does this do? What it does is it takes the sequence that you give it, and it goes through each permutation. It rearranges the pieces until it's finally sorted. Yeah. At that point, somebody discovers that they do care about performance. Okay? It's not just a detail. It turns out this is the point. Everything has a boundary. Find out where that boundary is. Just for kicks, of course. My favorite one is BOGO sort. Take a sequence, shuffle it randomly. Is it sorted? <laughs> yeah, details. Actually, I will admit my, my second favorite is this one. Um, we, we, you can run this in Bash. Oh, actually, you can run it in traditional Born Shell. It's called Sleep Sort, um, and uh, you know, so we can go ahead and we can do this, and we can just take one, three, one, four, one, five, nine, one, three, four, five. Wait for it. 
And there it is, nine. That's really cool. It's very strange, but it also tells you that's not the only figure that matters. It's not, so when you're going to look at this stuff, you need to look at it from many different points of view to really fully appreciate the shapes of these things, these little details. It turns out that this stuff kind of crops up and, and, and turns out to be exciting in the wrong way. There's a lovely story in uh, 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know uh, from J.C. Van Winkle, um, exactly about an ON squared situation at a large bank in the Netherlands, and that they had a performance problem that turned out to be to do with one loop and its N squared complexity. So these are the details that come to bite. You, know, you might say, well, we don't have them very often. Yeah, maybe we have them enough. So yeah, it turns out some of this stuff matters. I kind of like, you know, it's time for XKCD. Our field has been struggling with this problem for years. Struggle no more, I'm here to solve it with algorithms. Six months later, wow, this problem is really hard. <sighs> you don't say. So it turns out that we need a sort of um, a level of appreciation of how we organize things, our small details, like control flow. So I'm going to have a quick look at uh, one of the things I think is quite interesting, the, uh, um, this uh, Java 8 Streams um, cheat sheet from the beginning of last year um, uh, the, uh, from Zero Turnaround. And one of the things I, I quite liked about this one is that they posted this online, this cheat sheet, and it actually demonstrates a strength. So one of the, there's a, a number of points I want to make here. One is the point that just because details matter does not mean you need details in people's faces all of the time. The challenge of software development is to organize your details. That is why we care about abstraction. The idea is that you don't see everything simultaneously. And when it comes to things like control flow and loops, I'm fairly sure that everyone in this room has written enough loops in their life. And in fact, if somebody were to say, do you, do you feel the need between now and the, you know, the end of your life to write more loops? Have you written enough loops yet? Are there any loops that you've always wanted to write that you haven't yet had the opportunity to write? You know, what's on your loop bucket list? And it turns out that people don't have a loop bucket list because pretty much they've written all the loops they will ever need. Oh, you mean the loop where I do something to everything in a collection? You mean the loop where I look for something in a collection? You mean the loop where, yes, you've done them all. You've seen them all. You know how to do them. They're not exciting. They're mechanics. So the whole point is when we look at higher order approaches, what we're trying to do is say, yeah, yeah, we know that. There is a detail. We understand it, but it lives at this level. We want to compose at this level. So this is where Java 8 Streams takes us. But it also increases the visibility. The property of a good abstraction is that it removes the things we don't care about and makes things much more visible. What is interesting is the stream example is wrong. So I then tweeted, it's wrong. So they then corrected it, or rather incorrected it. They took something that was wrong and turned it into something else that was wrong, but it was differently wrong. OK, let's understand what's going on here. Um, Get the unique surnames in uppercase of the first 15 book authors that are 50 years old or older. Right. A library is a collection of books. Let's stream it. OK, let's get every single book and get the author from it. Let's filter in, let's select all of the authors that are 50 or older. Let's limit that to 15. Let's get the surname, shift it to uppercase, and uniquify it. So we're going to get the unique, ah, here's the problem. We haven't got the unique surnames in uppercase of the first 15 book authors. Um, what we've ended up getting is the unique surnames uh, of the first 15 authors. That's slightly different. If you, if you have, 15, um, if you have uh, 15 books at the beginning of your bookshelf that all have uh, the same author, you've counted that author 15 times. We want unique authors. Then we want, OK, let's try this one again. So here's the one they kind of fixed. Um, what they ended up doing is not quite right. They moved the uniqueness up. OK, we've got all the authors, over 50, surname uppercase. Now we're unique quite. No, that's the unique, the first 15 unique names that they've ended up with. That's not the same. You might have two authors that have the same surname. That's not what we want. The correct answer is you have to uniquify at two points. First of all, get all the authors. Make sure you've got unique authors. OK, so you don't count the same author twice. Now. There's 15 of those. Let's limit that. Now get the surname shifted to uppercase, and now uniquify. And now we're taking the unique names of the first 15 unique authors, to be, cl uh, to be clear. So what's the point of this? The point of this is that it's really easy to see. It's really easy to see. 
even to somebody who does not know um, the streams library. You can go through it, and you are able to reason about it very, very clearly. Brandon Rhodes had this uh, kind of comment on, in terms of this kind of composable code. Simple filters that can be arbitrarily chained are more easily reused and more robust than almost any other kind of code. There's a simple point here that we've arranged our details in a way that we don't have to worry about certain things. Now, I presented this example last year at a conference, and uh, um, Trisha G came up to me and she said, that was really good, but what would be really helpful for me and others is perhaps if you showed, what would it have looked like if you didn't have the Streams API? Hmm, good question. It would look like I need a smaller font. That's what it would look like. Okay. I have a smaller font available. There you go, that's the first version. Can you tell it's wrong? Here's the second version. Can you tell that's wrong? No. What about the correct version? Does that look more right or less right? Is it easier to read? If you look at it, it is dominated by noise. What we've done is we've promoted the wrong level of detail. In other words, we've basically said, oh, the really important thing here is loops mechanics. It's about loops and breaks. It's about your choice of fours and things. No. What we've done is we've raised the wrong level of detail to significance. We've actually hidden what's actually going on. So this is the idea. Details matter. They always matter. But part of the reason they matter is so you can hide some of them. You go, ah, this one, not so important at the moment at this level. You are choosing. You are making a choice here. So kind of a classic point. Um, we need to consider lines spent rather than um, you know, uh, uh, lines written as a good thing. Um, and I often point out that what we're interested in is decremental development, not incremental development. We need to get rid of stuff. Once you understand something, you can do something much more easily. If you've got a good memory, back in March last year, there was left pad, the left pad incident. A little piece of JavaScript, for various reasons, was pulled from NPM. And it turns out that a lot of people suddenly discovered they had a dependency on it. And therefore, that dependency was not fulfilled, and bits of the web stopped working. This must have been a pretty serious piece of code. So first of all, there is a lesson. If you haven't seen the O'Reilly books, or O'Reilly book covers, they're great. But there is, a, there is a, a, a taking on needless dependencies. Dependencies matter. They are not merely just, oh, another thing. You want to minimize your dependencies. You want to understand your dependencies. You also need to understand something else. Code written by some stranger on the internet is always perfect. Of course it isn't. This is the point. If you have children, you know this. If you have a, if you have a small child and they're going to pick something off off the street and they're about to put it in their mouth, you say, no, you don't know where that's been. And yet, we just, oh yeah, it's copied it off Stack Overflow. Yeah. yeah. So the point there is the same principle applies. So it must be really important, this piece of code, really complex. Oh, there it is. It's a rather, it's actually slightly long-winded, and it's not certainly a slightly weird way of padding a string. Everybody depends on this. So after it was pulled, by the way, it was replaced with this. I will just point out, I'm not going to show any other version. I'm just going to say it doesn't actually do the right job quite, but lots of people depend on it anyway. This does, is, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't have words for this, except for, you know, guess what? If you're using a proper language, um, like Python, uh, then it turns out, Zedfill, oh, just, these work. There is a point here, Anderson's Law, I have yet to see any problem, however complicated, which when you looked at it in the right way did not become still more complicated, okay? The problem is we spend our time distracted by the wrong details. The idea is that this should be an organized and solved detail. We end up getting obsessed with the wrong level because detail, oh, that's just a detail, how you're doing it. I think my, my favorite example of this uh, another of my favorites a couple of years back. A uh, man recreates the TSA, so the security service that bugs you at uh, uh, airports in the US. Uh, a number of years ago, they had an application, they, they, they had an application um, that ran on an iPad. And the application was to randomly put you in one queue or another as you were going through security. So randomize how people went through security. It would show either left or right. I want you to think for a moment how much effort that would involve to write. This, this, this guy created, he recreated this in a YouTube video, Chris Patcher. He took about 10 minutes to do it, and he was quite relaxed about it and made a few mistakes and so on. He could have done it in five minutes if he was in a hurry. Um, the overall cost of distribution 
and creation of this was $300,000. This guy just does it in a YouTube video. Just for fun, I thought, you know what? I wonder how much effort it would take to do just as a web app. So I started off, okay, randomly choose between a left arrow and a right arrow. Okay, right here, yeah. Let's do that. Surround it with script. Yeah, and then a bit of CSS. And because I keep mentioning body, we'll do that. So this is my solution. It turns out this is, you can apparently charge tens of thousands of dollars for this. I mentioned this to my children, and they said they weren't impressed. Dad, why didn't you do this? Why don't we have $50,000 more, was the only response they had. But it turns out this is actually quite acceptable. I, you know, it's, it's, uh, this actually works just fine. You know, it's, um, there you go. Yeah, yeah, there you go. I, I can now go around and charge sort of uh, £50,000 for that, $50,000. It's just great, fantastic. The point here is that had somebody sort of said, you know, the, the point here is that the details matter. You might say, well, that's not really industrial strength. Sure, but I've got you a prototype in the very same meeting that we're having the discussion about what you want. Yeah, but it's got to be more complex. I'm sure we can do that. Okay? <laughs> Anderson was very, very clear on this. Okay? Is this idea that... Uh, you know, we can make it more complex. So there is this point that we, when we focus on details, sometimes what we do is we dismiss the details that matter and, in, and focus on the ones that don't. And we, because we don't account for the fact that a detail can be a simplifying detail, that's the really important idea. It can be a simplifying detail. It can make the whole problem go away. And that is, that is very attractive. So what we need to understand is, this is a saying that I used to, about 20 years ago, I, 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 I was uh, mentioning this a lot, and a few years ago, Sebastian Hermida did a graphic of it. Typing is not the bottleneck. Okay? Typing is not the bottleneck in software development. That is not the problem that we have. When people sit there and go, well, what are, what are the big problems we have these days with software development and scheduling? I don't get people going, typing. People can't type fast enough. You might be thinking, oh, typing. Oh, right, static, and don't know. I'm not talking about that. That's a different conversation. So. Here's the point, that when we come to this commitment of detail, look at commit strip. If you're not following commit strip, I strongly recommend it. You have a project manager on the left. Someday we won't even need coders anymore. We'll be able to just write the specification and the program will write itself. Oh, wow, you're, you're right. We'll, have, we'll be able to write a comp comprehensive and precise specification and bam, we won't need programmers anymore. Exactly. And do you know the industry term for a project specification? That is comprehensive and precise enough to generate a program. Uh, no. Code. It's called code. That is what it is. It is the commitment to detail. It's not the hand-wavy stuff. It is not... All of that other stuff is a necessary um, beginning to a conversation, but it is not the end of the conversation. So I'm going to close with an observation I was reminded of. Um, Recently, uh, Robert Persig, the author of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, uh, passed away. And this is a book I read um, a couple of times. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of really good stuff in there. And I was directed uh, by Dylan Beatty to this uh, uh, lovely little quote. Uh, this is about motorcycle maintenance, as the title suggests. Uh, normally, screws are so cheap and small and simple, you think of them as unimportant. But now, as your quality awareness becomes stronger, you realize that this one individual particular screw, one that is jammed into your engine, is neither cheap nor small nor unimportant. We normally think of them as a detail, but what you've discovered is right now, this screw is worth exactly the selling price of the whole motorcycle. Because the motorcycle is actually valueless until you get the screw out. And that's a really important idea that sometimes we, we like the big pictures. We get distracted by the abstractions without forgetting that there's something that holds them up. With this reevaluation of all of this comes a willingness to expand your knowledge of it and therefore the relationship it has to everything else. So hopefully, on that note, I've left you with a very strong sense that the world is a strange place. Uh, there are some funny examples, and they're not all in your code that software is details. This matters. We need to uh, always keep this in mind. Thank you very much.